Nick, I got yeah. a bit of a bug with you. Okay. Um, last week when we were picking movies, which one we were going to talk about this week, uh, you said to me, just think about it like this. Today's film, Manhunter, is basically Red Dragon meets Miami Vice. Yeah. And that's not the problem I have. The problem I have is that you made it sound like that was a warning. Oh! Not a gift from God. Sometimes I do. I do I, <laughs> sometimes I pitch things and people have wrong interpretation, like it's a warning, like that dun dun. No, but you no, literally yeah. gave me the perfect yeah. soup of movie discussion, which is my favorite Thomas Harris book yeah. and one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I am. Um, I think the '80s peak with this movie. That in Miami Vice, of course, yeah. So <laughs> today we're going to talk about uh, Manhunter from director Michael Mann, which is Red Dragon meets Miami Vice. Say, Kyle and Nick on film. Yep. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from Go Film Reviews. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and thanks for watching. If you find us, thanks to you for uh, viewers. Uh, uh, you can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. You can contact us uh, that that way. Uh, check out our Patreon for some options that you can tell us what to do and support some films you can, uh, can critique on our show. Today, we're going to capture a movie that was really panned when it came out, but now it's a Monster hit a little bit because of CSI, I think, with William Peterson mm -hmm. and the uh, accolades that um, Michael Mann got after the 80s and the 90s with his movies, Collateral, well, it's a bit more Collateral 2004, but Collateral and Heat. We're going to talk about Manhunter. Yes, yeah, so Manhunter uh, is about former FBI profiler Will Graham, who's called back to service to investigate the Tooth Fairy Killer. Will has to get into the mind of the killer as his job promotes, which leads him further from sanity as he dives deeper and deeper into the killer's mind, risking his life and mind in his quest to understand. Hey, one of the interesting things is uh, the cinematographer is Dante Spinotti, but he also did cinematography for the remake, The Red Dragon. Oh, so yeah, he's with Brett Ratner. He also, I think, he did a lot of other movies with Brett Ratner. So, but it's really funny. The same cinematographer for Manhunter is for the other movie, Red Dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, this, yeah, I would always, always say, is Marky Michael Mann. I think mm -hmm. this is where he gets his groove. I think this is the kind of film I wish he had continued making. Right. And I mean Definitely. that in, in not a whole lot of sight, because really I've seen, I haven't seen a ton of Michael Mann movies, but the ones that I have seen that I really enjoyed um, were more towards the Manhunter, or I would say the Keep kind of style, yeah. Heat as well. Um, I personally am not a huge fan of Collateral, which a lot of people love. But I like what he did with in the '80s, and I kind of wish he kept this kind of style, this this yeah. uh, brooding but colorful color palette. And I think he lost the color palette with the '80s and just kept the brood. I wish you could see our green screen because that's the really the color that really gets peppered <laughs> around. Because the, even the credits, mm -hmm. there's a lot of inter, the, even the, of course the windows have to be neon green. Yeah, of course the background everything <laughs> neon green. Even the bad guys' windows has to be neon green. Oh yeah, you know what we're talking uh, about. Even Will, <laughs> Will Graham is walking in the streets. The lights in the building have to be neon green. Mm -hmm. So um, even his shirt is neon. green. So, like we said with a, a film we did a while back, uh, The Grudge, which used mm -hmm. yellow and didn't make it work here. Here, Michael Mann's really emphasizing a color without really, you, know, you really won't pay attention to it until you watch like the third time, the fourth time. Maybe you, it's like, oh yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, if you hadn't seen, like, I think watching this film, because I, I actually, I rewatched The Keep, like, recently. Because okay. I was just wanting to rewatch The Keep. It's a movie I keep going back to. Well, that's a lot um, of too. Yeah, so I rewatched that recently, and of course I've been watching some more and more Miami Vice, uh, because it's my life. But uh, as I've been going through those items and then revisiting kind of like his world again for Manhunter, yeah. you get to see this kind of style that he continues to promote. I mean, it almost feels like a cinematic universe of color that he yeah. just kept going. And that's why I think yeah. it's so weird when you when you jump forward 20 years and see such a drastic difference. He's got this real pop to the flavor of the film yeah. um, that kind of, it kind of plays off of the serious tone and maybe makes it a little bit more accessible. I don't know. Right, it, it, think it, it, the content, there's a lot of content, yep. and a lot of, I think if, if you read the book, a lot of it gets removed, but emphasis of characters and real Will and Jack Crawford and everything, mm -hmm. um, really emphasis all about change of beats for Will. Mm -hmm. If you notice, Michael Mann throughout the movie centers Will a lot in the movie. He's really centered almost all the time, even when he comes into this crime scene even when he's outside in the trees, even when he's talking to the cops, he's pretty much centered. Mm -hmm. And he offshoots everybody else, realizing that he is the focal point of the whole story. Exactly, yeah. which is a drastic difference from Red Dragon. I don't want to compare the two films because they're two different adaptations of the same work, but I will say yeah. this. Red Dragon is my favorite Hannibal Lecter book, 
And it's kind of that Karate Kid 1 and 2 thing where even though I know Silence of the Lambs is better, I think I actually prefer watching Red Dragon more. There's just a lot because more, I yeah. love that story so much. I think that story is just more connected to me. It's a creepy, it's a creepy vibe of that film and that in that book. And so looking at this one, um, it's nice to see Will Graham get the lead because you've got, we've had three adaptations of Red Dragon. We've had the two film versions, and of course on the television series Hannibal, which was a very loose redouble of it. But in all those versions of it. Uh, you know, Hannibal Lecter kind of has this guise over the film. He's not that big of a character in the book, even. Um, you know, he's a little bit more than he is in this film, but a little bit less than he is in every other Hannibal Lecter appearance. So I like that he's not the focal point, that Will Graham gets to take the lead, and actually him and his relationship to Jack Crawford get to have that that interplay more than anything else in the film. That's what I really appreciate. But if you even look when you shoot scenes with um, Dennis Farmer playing Jack mm -hmm. Crawford, Will occupies more oh, of the yeah. screen. He's in still fact, our main focus. Even, yeah. even Jack Crawford's in the background. But uh, it is so Michael Mann. I love it. Even when he's like, he realized the, he solved it. Mm -hmm. Oh, he bet he's seen the. And he looks out the window, and then he, he seriously touches the screen right there. And then the the music swells, of course, from Michael Mann. It's such a pivotal point. Mm -hmm. that, that's why I think this movie got a lot of disdain for it because it's really stylized, rather than people like I just want an adaptation for the book. You're really putting your own emphasis, your own trademarks yeah. here, Michael Mann. But now people enjoy it. For what that is, is Michael Mann's film. Yeah. yeah, and it doesn't feel this need to to connect to anything else or be. It's kind of its own like little demon. I probably wouldn't yeah. even have known this film existed if it hadn't been included in a DVD triple pack with the Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal, which I bought like ten years ago. Right. So I wouldn't yeah. even maybe known the film even existed, um, or that it was an adaptation of Red Dragon. It doesn't have the title of it. I think it's because was it The Way of the Dragon or The House of the Dragon? One of the dragon films that had come out in a similar year, and they didn't want cross-competition on the title. Yeah. So that's the whole reason this film kind of gets lost in the Hannibal Lecter world. Um, but yeah, yeah it is kind of got panned by critics, right? Panned yeah. by critics. It yeah. didn't do extremely well. Um, and then when you get the powerhouse of Silence of the Lambs with a completely different cast. I mean, there's one there's one cast member that appears in both films, which and it's Frankie Faison, but he doesn't play the same character. <laughs> he plays uh, a cop in this film who's looking over the IDs near the end of the film. And he appears as the guard in Red Dragon, Hannibal, and Silence of the Lambs. Oh, um, so name. there is one that's through deep, character. Right. <laughs> that's deep. Man. Yep. And then the cinematographer is the same for Red Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting yeah. that we actually got two very different films, because they're both based on the same book. They yeah. both have, were shot by the same person. And, and overall, they, they kind of have, they have a pretty similar through line, even though they're drastically different. And I kind of appreciate that as a fan of the book. I do. Uh, in the beginning of the movie is really Michael Mann showing up because what he does is well you have a couple little close up shots of inanimate objects but then all you get the big on the beach scene mm -hmm. and what he does is he goes up with the sky then down and then you have the conversation where the hell is the boom mic they must have done without mm -hmm. sound so they must have had a redub it because there is no boom mic There's well it's the done in silhouette though so I guess they could have done it in post without they as had much to. work yeah. you know I mean it would still been, have been tough because you've got to get that cadence I will never disrespect anyone who's done ADR before but yeah. Um, but, but yeah that really would have had to have been maybe silhouette minus a boom maybe they they I had to go back and then redub it the audio because mm -hmm. there is no there had to be no boom mic they just say just do your lines the camera's so far away there's no way you're like yeah, yeah, unless the boom was hooked up to the camera as it was panning down, but that I can't imagine working very well. You so would have had that shadow. Lot, I think a lot of the audio, especially for distance, was probably re-recorded mm -hmm. or put in sound added later because I don't think there's very much boom miking in this movie. Michael Mann is really showing off. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that. There is one problem with that. I, I, I watched my cut of the film on my DVD player, and I searched for a couple scenes on YouTube because I wanted to see if this was a problem elsewhere, and I did notice it was that there's a lot of room tone in certain scenes of this movie. And it's weird. I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, but it kind of, like, my, I, was, I found myself listening to the room tone okay. instead of the voices. And maybe the, maybe the clips I saw on YouTube were taken from the same source. Maybe that's the case. But I noticed room tone. It kind of, like, weirded me out a little bit. I was like, I'm trying to focus on the story. Thankfully, I know the story. But <laughs> Maintaining another uh, little dialogue about the conversation about the, the scene, because they're on a beach... The driftwood. They're on the driftwood and they're symmetrical. They're balanced. One's going this way, one's going this way. And yeah. they have a conversation. But he cut, he edited 
meticulously well too because he starts a cigarette and then he cuts up him handling that cigarette and he's going to start it and then he cut back again and he's smoking it mm -hmm. so even he's showing up even editing the dialogue exchange yeah and not i don't think he had a boom like this is fantastic it's very well edited from the, the moment the movie starts every sequence plays out perfectly timed um and i think there, there's yeah. another editing moment that i really really took to in this film and that was um they they keep ask they ask questions about like you know where's the killer what's he where is he gonna strike that they've run out of options and then they do this smash cut to get our introduction of the killer and it's like right on display before we really even know yes. who he is right i remember that scene mm -hmm. right or the, the scene of the all the guys together like almost a circle talking and michael just pivots to one guy we really don't even know i don't know if that was like the captain of police yeah and just keeps his reaction yeah, as everybody's talking, you usually a person, a journeyman, kind of, a journeyman director like me will focus on the person who's talking. But he said his per, the person's reaction as things are transpired. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a mode of visual storytelling that we don't get very often because it's not easy to do. Like you have to have complete uh, cooperation between your cinematographer and your editor and you as a director because you have to know that you're telling the story with your camera and not the people on screen telling it. The camera's doing a lot of the storytelling in this movie. It definitely mm -hmm. is, right, yeah. Even though, even when things transpire and you see Dennis Farrow's contempt and oh, fire. There was another scene, the scene where it just, just, you can see scorching through um, his eyes, yeah. In that scene where we find out that, uh, potential spoiler alert, that uh, Dr. Lecter gave Will's address to the killer. We get the moment, we don't hear uh, Dennis Farina tell him that they're safe. We instead get a smash cut to the boy waking up his mother in bed and saying there's someone outside. Yeah. And so we think, oh my God, it's, right. the, it's the killer. Like, right. And even as a person who's read the book, I was like, maybe it's a different interpretation. Um, but they go in and they get up and we have to follow that dread moment as she walks to the door and then discovers it's the police and that they're safe. That's a great moment of it is. It's, trickery in the story. But it keeps your interest because you, there's a potential to a lull. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you have that Really start to your engine when you're watching it again. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about green in this. Another aspect of this movie that Michael Mann uses really well is white. So the, uh, the leads, when they get murdered, their entire bedroom is all white. Yep. White on white. I mean, that's what we kind of did in the 80s. And the bathrooms. But even including um, Hannibal Lecter's jail is yeah. all white. And that's so maybe more noticeable yeah. because we've seen the other interpretation of what that jail cell looks like. Yeah. That it's just it's so strikingly white. It is, but we've seen a lot of color. And I mm -hmm. think Michael Mann knows how you emphasize color. Is sometimes you subtract it. And yeah. then you put the white in there. Of course, all the beach scenes are really white on white. And there were white, a lot of white. Yeah, so, his use of natural lighting and, and just lighting in general is, is extremely well done here. And, and it, yeah. it creates a void then where Hannibal Lecter is. Which is good because he doesn't have a lot of scenes. I think he shot his role in three days. Brian Cox is a great Hannibal Lecter, by the way. Um, he shot it in three days, and like he creates a void in that performance. Then where he like sucks us in just long enough to get the information and the story we need, and then keeps on moving. Right. Yeah. So how do you emphasize color? Sometimes, well, you have to move a contrast, like remove it almost completely, and almost like you use white. You're kind of washing, washing out all the stuff that we absorb recently. Yeah. So even even with color you have to really go dark. There's a lot of people where costuming is a lot of dark. Yep. Yeah, yeah that's true. Like, and, and I think when you compare, you know, a William Peterson's Will Graham doesn't have a ton of color to his character. Like, his clothing is still fairly procedural, but then there's, like, pops of it in, the, in his yeah. clothing, too, that kind of highlight him amidst a bunch of tuxedoed <laughs> individuals. You know, they kind of give us, like, a, a clue that, you know, he's... He's our guy. He's the one we're following. Kind of a reminder, like, this is Will's story. And maybe that's all hindsight 2020 because we've seen other interpretations of this book. But it's nice. I really like that we spend time with Will and his psyche in yeah. this film. Because I think in the book you have a lot of his inner dialogue, mm -hmm. which in the movie you're going to have to speak out. Yeah. And, and where this film wins in that inner dialogue, actually, is something that's very unique to this adaptation of it, which is as he gets closer to understanding the Tooth Fairy... His, we start to see what's going on in his mind yeah. as he imagines being the killer. That's not something we got in the other adaptations, to my knowledge. And it's something that I think is a good translation of what happens in the book, but not as literal. But that great moment where he walks, he, he's visualizing himself walking to the victim. And she's got her yes. eyes open and the light shoot out in the mouth. It reminded me of the creature from The Keep, actually. Where I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, whoa! Yeah, like, the, what the, you know, because yeah. it steps way out of, out of complete nowhere. We, we haven't have gotten any surrealist moments in the film up until that point and that's where it catches us and we realize that will is standing on a 
He's standing on a tipping point. He can he tip to it. insanity or he can tip to freedom. Yeah. And that, that's the biggest... I love that the struggle is his in the film and not a shared struggle between him and Lecter. I, I keep going back to that, but it's so important to the movie and his character. And it's what I think makes the two adaptations so much fun because they're both so different. <laughs> in fact, even that scene where Will has inner dialogue and he's watching the tapes... Mm -hmm. Michael Mann puts the camera behind the TV, which is really weird, and the TV occupies like a lot of the space, yep. so it really blackens it out. But even though Will is off center, he's still centered of the frame. Yes, because the TV's occupying a lot of the space, and, and he's using the light to point at Will. Yeah. the light of the television. Again, yeah. it's a, a creative use of lighting. It it like makes the lighting tell the story with the camera. Like so, we're seeing what's happening literally and mentally. Yeah, and there's very few camera movements. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, he does move the camera quite a bit, but he keeps it still, relatively still, a lot, which makes it unnerving because even when he you know, investigates the Leeds murder, he just holds that camera still to, so Will can occupy the frame, stand still, and then we see him, you know, ex exposition of what happened and transpired. Yeah. So a lot of it's really, a lot of it is really centered, a lot more than I thought it would be after watching this many times. Mm, yeah. yeah. And, and what's interesting is, if, of course, I, I have revisited a lot of Miami Vice recently, and the pilot episode, which was directed by a man, uh, Brothers Keeper, shares a lot in common with the way that he moves his camera. It is more based on Crockett and Tubbs, and when we get, and since they're separate for so much of that pilot episode, we do get the same kind of sense that Graham gets here, which is that he is our center focus until they collide. And I think it's interesting. It's almost like oh. he, he wanted to showcase, like, see what you did by taking the keep out of my hands. Like, see what you did. I created a television series that did this. I created a movie that did this. And, like, and it's, it's, it works. And even though the film was panned, people have gone back to it now and said it really did work. You know? It did. Yeah. Right. In fact, you have one magnificent stunt in the movie. Which one are you talking about? Uh, let's go through the window. Let's not even oh. knock on the door. And it right on point with the music? Because I, yeah. I criticize one actual thing that no, I music is really part, the part film of the stunt too. is I think that of all the times, Michael Mann utilizes music so well in everything he does. Even though I don't it does, think even though the Vita works in that finale. In that finale, that dun, 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 I, Yeah. Right. I. I, it only works like as that moment when he's jumping through the glass where I was like, yeah, I was like into it, but I didn't feel that song's place in the movie. You're right, you but know. I still like the stunt. Oh, it's a great stunt. Oh, like, because even if you're watching, like, there's no way he's going to do that. There's no way, oh, he did it. He did it. Well, and knowing too that, you know, we keep, we keep getting reminders throughout the film that he's not supposed to be getting invested. You know, he says at the very beginning, I'm just going to look through the, the tapes. I'm going to look through the house. Right. I'm just going to tip my toes in the water. And, yeah. uh, and then he's like, and then I'm just going to go talk to Lecter because nobody else can. And then I'm just going to put myself on the line and take pictures of myself. But my family will be safe. And then it's, oh, I just gave away my family, but now I got them to safety. Like, every time he takes a further step out on the ledge, right. he keeps pushing where he's going to go. It's a push your luck movie. It is definitely a push. My favorite scene in the movie, we talk about great shots and everything, but still, my favorite shot in the movie is um, talking with this kid in the cereal aisle, uh, cereal aisle at the grocery store mm -hmm. because I was that kid at that age, and I was, finally, my family, we could have, have indulged in all the kind of cereals. And cereal aisle in the 80s was just like candy, man. Oh, yeah. I saw that Count Chocula in the background. When Count Chocula was year-round, okay? Oh, it man. be done again. To be a kid and the first thing you mom, can we go check out the, can we pick out our cereal? Yeah, go. And you just bolted. That's because yeah. you knew you weren't going to get into the candy aisle. No. You, but this is the next best thing. But, and, of course, the toys and everything. You want to see what toys are. My, it'll still be my favorite scene of them talking and having the, at the cereal aisle in the grocery store. And I like that he's having such a personal conversation with his son. Yeah. Outside, like, his wife does not need to be there to supervise, even though he's clearly had some some mental difficulties right. over yeah. his life, that, that she trusts that he has come back from that enough to let him try and... Try and discuss this like issue he's had with his son in public, and maybe he's doing that because he wants his son to feel safe in public as opposed to in the privacy of the home. But like, there is something kind of special about the the you know the the neon lights that would be up in the air during these kinds of like mm -hmm. supermarket scenes. Like, I, I think it's just kind of a nice little slowdown of the movie that just reminds you who were who our characters are. Yeah, <laughs> I, have, I had a good friend of mine. Uh, I won't name her name, but she was she was born uh, in the '90s, and she asked, "What was the '80s like?" And I said, "We didn't do nothing subtle, nothing." Mm -hmm. 
clothes, art, everything. Murder. Murder. We didn't do anything subtle. And this is another fine example. We didn't do anything subtle, but they, even with the music. Yep. Um, and that's why I say I think it peaked with Manhunter. Obviously, in 86, you have, I think everything was pretty much a peak year for movies. Because you had like Top Gun and all that stuff. Yeah, this maybe it was like our last ditch effort before we started to realize like it's going to change again. Maybe yeah. they were, you know, yeah. taking taking on the seventies, kind of coming to an end. And you know, in, the, in what eighty, I think we kind of said was when the seventies really felt like they were tying down. And then like eighty one, it's like now we have a new birth of something else that's fresh in our style. And maybe this is the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely peaked around eighty six, and this is one of the movies that even though it got panned when it came out because I think people thought it was overtly eighties and all the just the right style rather than having the content. People are reinvestigating it and appreciating for Michael Mann's accomplishment. There's something to it. I mean, actors continue to work with Michael Mann, even though he, critics really didn't really like his stuff. They continued to work with him, even afterwards. I mean, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro really wanted to work with him. Mm -hmm. Not, yeah, not, not Martin Scorsese, you know, not Coppola, were yeah. they able to bring together. Michael Mann did. Mm -hmm. Well, and we, we also, we, we can't stop without talking about, like, the great supporting cast that's on display here. Because we talked about yeah. Ryan Cox a little bit. He's always going to get overshadowed by Hopkins. But I think he did a pretty good job of playing a different version of Lecter. Right. You know, I, he, he I, kind of right. plays it differently. I think it's far more downplayed, it's far more quieter, mm -hmm. where I think Anthony Hopkins played a little more louder, a little yep. more. Well, and there's, in, in uh, Hopkins' version of the character, there's a bit more sensuality in how he plays Lecter. You yeah. know, he's kind of a slithery eel, just kind of like trying to get up in your situation. Brian Cox, there's a very significant choice they made. They made him a killer of college girls. They took out the homosexual overtones, um, or bisexual overtones of Hannibal Lecter's character that we would later see, you know, exuded in the Ridley yeah. Scott Hannibal film and whatnot. So yeah. there's a significant change to kind of decrease, take out the homosexual overtones, and and just in general, he may have been murdering college students in a non-sexual kind of way, whereas Anthony Hopkins' character was always kind of a little bit more sensual about his stuff. I say Brian Cox a little more realistic, a little more not I, I like an idyllic evil, a little yeah. more pathetic, a little more. You can navigate around him a little more human. Yeah, I um, think so. Yeah. Uh, before we go, I, the, I forgot about it. Eight ball hemorrhage. I haven't even heard that line forever. He uses. <laughs> if you didn't know what an eight ball hemorrhage is, which is a, you get a hemorrhage in your eye mm -hmm. and it becomes so black that only the white is your iris, so it looks like an eight ball. Mm. I don't think I've heard that line forever. Yeah. It's like, oh my god, eight ball hemorrhage. All right, because as a kid, you get beat up all the time. Yeah, like, yeah, that kid's got an eight ball hemorrhage. Huh. <laughs> There's Ooh, another term. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, like, this movie, we could probably go on hours and hours of talking about it. I, I just realized today that they actually kind of readapted this movie into an episode of Miami Vice um, oh, from wow. season three called Shadow in the Dark, where the two characters are going to investigate crime scenes um, after oh, the fact to try and get in the head of the killer. I'm going to go watch that episode later. Today. I would say one thing about Miami <laughs> Vice is they had great casting directors. Mm -hmm. They found people, brand new talent, to get a start. Yep. And you go back and see how a lot of people got their start, just, a, I guess, appearing on Miami Vice. Well, and I think some of them yeah. got continued roles in this. Um, some yeah. of them, I remember, appearing in the first season. They had Vice, great got casting to directors. Over to this as well. And then I've got to point out, too, Tom Noonan, who always plays the sinister, weird characters, gets to play another really great sinister, weird character. And a completely unrecognizable Stephen Lang as Freddie Lowndes. Um, I did not. I would not have known that was him. Stephen Lang. I got to see this now. Now I got to see this. Right. No, no uh, Stephen Lang in the movie in Manhunter. Oh, Manhunter. Man Freddie Lowndes. The I blind thought you meant man from Don't Breathe. Like I, I thought you meant the, oh, the Mighty Vice. Maybe that episode. I I'll have to watch listen. that episode too. I but like, to but yeah, the, the cast is just incredible in this, right. and I think that's that's maybe a Michael Mann staple too. Is that he has a real knack for getting people in this movie that are worth it. He does. <laughs> you know? Absolutely does. Right. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, you think about it, Manhunter was filmed in between this Miami Vice, right in the middle yeah. of Miami Vice when they're doing That's it. That's why I think that you literally could have just turned it into an episode if you wanted to. Right. You really could have. The visually aesthetic could have been exactly that. Just pop out Will Graham for a couple other characters. They both have home life that are problems, so why not? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> have you seen Manhunter? You got you, man. Yeah. Let us know down in the comment section below your take on this film. Um, where does Brian Cox land on your list of Hannibal Lecter's? I still say Matt Mickelson is a dark horse for best. Um, let us know down in the comment section below that. Is this your favorite Lecter film? What's your ranking of the, the Thomas Harris adaptations? Let us know. 
we would love to hear about that. Our favorite thing is getting those comments from people. So I do. We do. Um, it's nice to hear from yeah. you. And then while you're down there, as Nick suggested, like, subscribe, check out that Patreon. Lots of tiers as low as a dollar, but for $5 and up per month, you can help us pick some of the different films that we talk about on the show. And you know you want to do that because, hey, it's tough picking movies. All right? Yeah. So <laughs> we, we don't mind being awkward. Pick yeah. something that we, uh, yeah. We, we've talked worse. Yeah. And we've talked better. Yeah. But we're going to talk some more next time. <laughs> so until then, uh, you can find all my film reviews on gofilmreviews.com. Uh, you can find my show, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts. Perfect, and we'll see you at the next crime scene. Crime, baby. <laughs> <laughs>